Hello, my name is Sarah Jones. I'm the executive director of the Great North Innocence Project. Thank you for watching this today. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us uh, some special guests and we're going to have a conversation and question and answer about the film, The Phantom, which is a new documentary by the filmmaker Patrick Forbes that premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival earlier this year. The film is a gripping portrayal of the story behind the wrongful conviction and execution of Carlos de Luna. The Phantom is based on a 2012 book length piece by Columbia law professor, James Liebman, Great North Innocence Project staff attorney, Andrew Marquardt, and others that was subsequently released in 2014 as the book, The Wrong Carlos, Anatomy of a Wrongful Execution. I'd like to provide you with a, just a little bit of background about the case. Carlos de Luna was convicted for the 1983 stabbing murder of Wanda Lopez in Corpus Christi, Texas, and was executed for that crime in 1989. When Professor Liebman and his team at Columbia University dug into the case years later, what they found was a case study in the many ways that a criminal case can go wrong. They ultimately developed overwhelming evidence that DeLuna was innocent and that another man, Carlos Hernandez, was the true killer. The Phantom now tells that story in a new medium with a mix of original interviews and archival footage. Joining us today for a discussion of the film is uh, the director, Patrick Forbes. Patrick is a documentary filmmaker based in the UK and director of The Phantom. His career began as a very junior researcher on a BBC series when he was arrested after discovering that Britain had a very secret spy satellite over Russia. It became clear to him then that documentary filmmaking was his future and offered a lot more excitement and interest than his previous career as a bank economist. Patrick has gone on to win, uh, to become one of Britain's best documentary filmmakers, winning the best director BAFTA for his Channel 4 series, The Force, best series BAFTA for the National Trust with the BBC, and having his documentary feature about Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, Secrets and Lies, premiere at South by Southwest before being seen around the world. Patrick believes that documentary is an art form that is as vital, exciting, and uplifting as the best drama, a view confirmed by his recent films tracking Britain's tumultuous exit from uh, the European Union, where everyone involved talks with extraordinary candor about this defining moment. James Liebman is the Simon H. Rifkin Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and Director of the Center for Public Research and Leadership. He earned his BA from Yale and a JD from Stanford University and served as a law clerk to Judge Carl McGowan of the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and went on to clerk for United States Supreme Court Justice Paul, John Paul Stevens. He worked as assistant counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund before joining Columbia law, Columbia's law faculty in 1985, where he served as vice dean from 1991 to 1992. His work focuses on institutional design and change in two US contexts, public education and criminal justice. He's authored numerous works on those subjects, and in, including matters related to the death penalty, like the Carlos de Luna case. Among other things, he led a team at Columbia University Law School that reinvestigated the conviction of Carlos de Luna. And as I said earlier, ultimately became a book. Andrew Marquardt is a staff attorney with the Great North Innocence Project. Andrew joined uh, our organization in 2019 and has quickly become um, a go-to person for our clients investigating and litigating cases, not only in Minnesota and South Dakota, um, but currently in Mississippi as well. Last year, Andrew uh, won the release of his client, Ronnie Cooper, 
Ronnie had been imprisoned uh, for a drug crime that he did not commit, and Andrew diligently worked on his case before joining us when he was in private practice, and then continued to represent uh, Ronnie after he joined us and secured his release last year. Andrew worked with Professor Liebman on the book, The Wrong Carlos, and joins Patrick and Jim for our discussion today. So, this is a, a really intriguing case, and um, I've been familiar with it because of the book and the film. And I will say that uh, seeing it dramatized through the documentary um, really helps one understand uh, even further what went on and speaks to your heart even, even more. I think we all really feel compelled by film um, so Patrick, how, how did you become aware of the Carlos de Luna case? And what, in, what initially sparked your interest in uh, using it as a subject for a documentary? So the honest answer is that I wasn't interested first time. I was making another film and that film was incredibly problematic. Um, and during the making of it, uh, my producer, um, who is a very assiduous and tough woman, uh, said, Patrick, Look at this, this is an extraordinary article. It was an article about Jim's work. And she said, we have got to do this. And I said, look, Tilly, just leave it. Come on, we've got to sort this stuff out. And then she said, no, 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 this is really important. Anyway, so I read it. And as I read it, I thought to myself, she's right. This is really important. And the essence of it is everybody's greatest fear that you are accused of doing something that you haven't done, whether it's stealing a sweet or killing a person. And the penalty for that crime is death. And that is the stuff of drama. It's the stuff of books. It's the stuff of film and, and you know, far beyond a mere documentary. And I said, right, we're in. Because this stuff, this issue is both important and inherently dramatic. And I thought we could bring something to it um, rather optimistically. And so I got a flight over to New York, uh, where Jim, who was being besieged by Hollywood at the time, very kindly let me in and eventually agreed that, yes, we would collaborate on uh, making this documentary. So here we are today. And Jim, what drew you to the case initially when you started doing uh, your work that led to the article and book? Well, in the late 1990s and into the um, new century, I had done a set of studies about um, the outcomes of all of the capital cases that had been decided in the United States by the courts since the reestablishment of the death penalty in the mid 1970s. Um, and um, the, the finding of that study was that about two thirds of all capital cases uh, were overturned by the courts eventually uh, in the United States, um, revealing a tremendous amount of error, substantial, significant uh, legal error and factual error in those cases. Um, and our view was there was so much error in the system that it was impossible for the courts to catch it all. But of course, the counter assumption was, no, actually this proves that the courts are doing such a great job that they're going to catch all of the errors. So the next step in the process was to look and see if we could identify a case or cases where um, uh, an innocent person had been executed because of the failure of the courts and everybody else to catch the problem. Uh, we couldn't do this comprehensively, but a group of students and I started looking in Texas, which of course uh, has and had at that time the largest number of executions. And the first thing we did was just to look at cases that were single eyewitness cases. As you all know, at the Innocence Project there, eyewitness um, identification evidence is some of the worst evidence uh, that we know of. So we thought that that was a pretty good place to start. Um, one of my students uh, came across the DeLuna case uh, in which uh, the appellate decision revealed that he had claimed that another man named Carlos uh, had um, committed the crime. And so we thought maybe we would look into it. I was actually at the time working with a group of other lawyers who were sort of helping me vet the cases and you know, just use their instincts to help me identify the right cases. And one of those lawyers, a very well-known 
uh, capital lawyer in the United States, um, uh, said, oh, this Carlos de Luna case is a total loser. Uh, nobody could possibly believe this some other dude named Carlos did it defense. Um, and that was the way we left it, except that later on I had an uh, investigator who was going to Corpus Christi, Texas to look at another case that we had identified. And I just told him, look, if you have an hour while you're there, when you're not doing something, just go and see if you can find this Carlos Hernandez to see if he actually existed, despite the fact that the police and the prosecution had said he didn't exist. And within that hour, the investigator found Carlos Hernandez and his criminal records. And we went on from there to explore the case and it unfolded in the way that we developed in the book and that um, uh, Patrick with a lot of additional evidence developed in the uh, documentary. Wow. Now, Andrew, you became involved in this case when you started working with Jim at, when you were a law student at Columbia University. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And what was your role in investigating this case? So I came on um, a little bit later in the process. Uh, Jim had a team that had done kind of the initial uh, fact gathering process and interviews and so on. And so what we had was sort of a big mass of, of raw data in terms of interview transcripts and documents and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and the project was to sort of sort through it and, and you know, turn it into a, a narrative, into a story, um, something that would uh, have the rigor of a, a law review article, and but also sort of the readability and appeal for for a broader audience, which we ultimately hope to to speak to. Um, so I was involved in in the sort of structuring and and ultimately drafting uh, of the piece that became the book. Patrick, uh, Jim referenced that you did additional research into the case. Uh, can you tell us about that? What, what, uh, what did you do beyond what had already been done pretty comprehensively? Well, I mean, it, 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 Jim is being characteristically generous here. But what I, what I decided was that we would, as far as possible, have to re-talk to everybody that Jim talked to and also talk to some of the people that for good or ill, Jim hadn't been able to get to. And that in particular meant some of the cops, but also the attorneys on the case. And that I think was because we wanted to provide, Andrew's just said that they were developing a compelling argument. We wanted to talk to, in a documentary, you want to talk to, as it were, both sides of the story. You want to say, all right, X says to Y, what do you think? And in my particular style of documentary, it's, a holistic approach to storytelling. You know, you don't want to hear the voice of P. Forbes telling you what to think. I want everybody, I want the, the, the watcher to sit there and decide for themselves between the, as it were, the two sides of the story, who's telling the truth. And not only did I want to do that, but also I wanted to film the people we were filming in the place where events took place. Um, so, for example, and this turned out to be a crucial point, one night we were filming the policeman who had arrested Carlos de Luna. And as we were filming this policeman doing, reenacting the arrest, he hadn't been there for 20 odd years. It was, as luck would have it, it was on a cold, damp night, exactly like the night of the arrest and murder. As we were doing this, out of a house, comes a key witness. Now, everybody who watches the film, I'm not going to say any more, but first of all, a key witness came out who had not been uncovered by Jim, who, or indeed the police in the first place. And then in addition to that, another, because it was a small street where this took place, another person tugged at me and said, you've got to talk to, uh, and gave the name of a key policeman who had been involved in the manhunt on the night, who came forward with additional evidence. So it's not as though, we, were, we weren't sort of, I don't know, the great detective re-examining everything, but by virtue of our approach to it, we had to re-examine Jim's source material and by pure chance add to it. Uh, and that's what we did. And that's, well, I have to say that is the job of documentary. It's not to believe the word of everyone. You'd start with a completely clean slate. 
uh, and then see what comes up. And the film is the result of that. Well, I will say it's it's very compelling. Um, now, Jim, the, the case involved a whole lot of uh, errors and, um, you know, kind of the, the full range of, of people involved in the criminal justice system. Is, is the takeaway that there have to be a lot of errors kind of muddled together to create a, a, a situation where the system gets it wrong and doesn't, doesn't discover its errors until it's too late? I guess I would say the takeaway is that um, there are many, many ways in which cases can go wrong. The standard way when I began my career of looking into this and writing about it was the idea that number one, you've got a very high profile case where some uh, important person in the community um, uh, has been killed and the community is up in arms uh, about that and wants to find somebody and police officers or the prosecution go out and do usually one thing wrong in order to uh, make their case and convince the public that they've solved the problem. And what this case taught me is that although that certainly happens, and I'm sure you've encountered cases like that in your innocence work, there are other ways in which um, uh, problems arise and maybe more often. And what struck me about this case was um, nobody cared one whit about this case. It was a poor young Hispanic woman working in a, a gas station alone, who was the victim. Uh, nobody cared about her in particular. Uh, and there was a, um, uh, a, a man who had a criminal record and uh, who had been in trouble a lot, who was identified as the person who did it. It all looked like it fit together. And that was uh, you know, the easiest thing to do. And um, that's, that's what happened. And, and, and so what I learned from this case is that Number one, sometimes, and maybe a lot of the time, the cases that get the worst uh, attention and uh, are subject to the worst problems are ones that nobody cares about at all. And nobody really feels compelled to do their job in those cases. And the second point about that is that when that sort of thing happens, uh, it is a perfect storm of problems because uh, all of the things that uh, you can imagine going wrong, uh, do go wrong from what the defense attorneys are doing, what the police are doing, what the prosecutors are doing, what the judges uh, in the case um, are, are doing. And um, I think that uh, the way that Patrick has laid this out really makes that um, clear across the whole spectrum of uh, the case. Yeah, I couldn't agree. I have to say, this is very bad to say to Jim, but I couldn't agree more with him. It's, it's absolutely the case that that nobody cared and they didn't care because for good or ill corpus christi regarded or at least the the higher up portion of society in corpus christi regarded the hispanic uh, population as largely disposable and that was the root cause of it um, that was the macro cause as it were to return to the language of economics the micro cause was as jim said one person who is in the wrong place at the wrong time and everything else follows from that. But the underlying societal cause was complete lack of concern about a substantial portion of uh, that town's society. And it was, and it's a problem that in Corpus's case stretches back a hundreds of, well not hundreds of years, but a, a hundred years uh, to the war between Texas and indeed Mexico. and. The violence and distrust has stemmed from that day, and it is no particular surprise that Corpus Christi is the birthplace of the Latin America of the Latin American civil rights movement, because those problems persist, and that's what lies behind the neglect that Jim uh, so eloquently described. Jim, is that something you've seen Patrick, in other cases? Um, sorry, just saying it was the first time, Patrick, you've agreed with me, so. <laughs> Good thing we're recording, huh? <laughs> Don't let it go to your head, okay? <laughs> it's on the record now. Uh, Jim, is, is that kind of uh, lack of concern for the victims or lack of concern for uh, the defendants something that you see running through a lot of these cases? Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, one of the things that we've 
puzzled over for you know for decades is that um, the disparities and discrimination that appear to occur in these cases is based on the race of the victim as yeah. much as or even in some cases more than the race of the defendant. Uh, and I think that this case exemplifies how that operates. Um, uh, and and in, in, in this case, it was that this was a disposable victim, both uh, in terms of how her employer treated her and in terms of how the police and others treated her. And so the case did not get the attention. Um, and whereas on the other hand, the kind of case I described originally of somebody who's prominent in the community, usually white, um, uh, and usually, uh, you know, um, economically advantaged, um, gets that's where all of the attention in the system is applied. And so I yeah. think that that's a systemic kind of issue, but this case really shows how all of that works itself out in the, the, the tiniest decisions of pretty much everybody in the case as to how they're going to do it, who they're going to appoint as defense counsel, or how much time you're going to spend on the yeah. investigation at the scene, et cetera. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And it snowballs. The, the, what's interesting about it from a forensic point of view is it always sounds such a sort of broad brush thing to say, oh, discrimination's behind it. But you can see it in every detail or every stage of this case, from literally the night to, you know, the subsequent arrest to the failure to go and interrogate whether somebody else might have done it to the way that the court process is handled it goes right the way through even indeed to the speed with which the execution is carried out so there is no sense that anybody is looking out for anybody in fact concerned in this case at any stage um, and i found that both chilling and fascinating and incredibly, uh, as, as one of the reviews of the movie has said, it's infuriating because you just think, really? Uh, aren't we better than this? Isn't there no way at any stage somebody could say, hey, what's going on here? And it seems to me, and it is, I hope, not saying a disservice to Jim, that for, for this to be exposed so long after the events is in itself shocking, actually. You know, it's take, it takes one afternoon and uh, a law professor, you know, hundreds of miles away, setting a task for his students for it to be exposed. And that really, really seems extraordinary. Surely a human life is worth rather more than that. I'll just say real quick, you know, um, I've definitely seen this basic dynamic play out in some of the cases we review. Uh, and, you know, not just death penalty cases, but uh, many of the homicide cases that we're reviewing or have reviewed involved this dynamic of, you know, a, a suspect on the margins of society and a victim on the margins of society. In South Dakota, many of these involve native populations where there's a similar sort of um, dynamic in terms of disregard and, and, and uh, we see this playing out over and again. So it's, it's definitely a, a major dynamic in our system. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to give the, the picture that it's confined to you know, this is purely, as it were, an American thing, and it's a sort of beating the American system. It's, you know, it is a problem that grips the Western world. I've made a film in uh, a tough bit of South London where I watched two murder detectives say one to the other, it's just two black guys killing each other. Who's going to give a shit about that? To use one of a word that I'm allowed to use. And you just thought, wow, we're really going to get justice here. And, you know, this is what happens and happened uh, in 1983. I think we see that play out in the, the broader spectrum of wrongful conviction cases that we look at and the statistics bear out that, um, you know, the, the majority of uh, wrongful convictions uh, fall on uh, people of color, Black people, Indigenous people, um, and other people of color. Uh, and I Imagine, um, although the statistics I've seen don't don't talk about it, that the victims um, fall into the same categories, um, and it, you know, we see that now with uh, commissions being started to look into missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, which has been rampant uh, at least in our region, um, and I imagine elsewhere as well. And it, I have to say, in Corpus Christi's case, back in the eighties. In addition to these societal problems, the city as a whole was itself almost falling apart. There was crime rampant. There was, you know, there was 
a big drugs problem. It's a major port and a lot of stuff was coming through and the town was sort of slightly buckling under the impact of that. And so you've got a major problem, which is then in turn made worse by the situation of the people who are supposed to be keeping a lid on it. Um, anyway, and it's an, it was an extraordinary, I have to say, making the film, going from the basis of Jim's work and then turning up in Corpus and realizing what had gone on and what had prompted it was a real, um, to use a terrible phrase, journey, but it was a real journey, a uh, journey I hope of enlightenment. So Patrick, uh, you, you mentioned that um, Jim was being um, hounded by Hollywood. Um, <laughs> what, what makes this, this case or this story um, so well suited for documentary film as opposed to um, a dramatic um, uh, well, oh gosh, there's a, there's a thing. Well, I have to say, and it sounds awful to say it, it is that, first of all, everybody involved, a lot of the people involved were still alive, just um, in some cases. So the dramatis personae, my cast of characters was there, and they were all extraordinary talkers, as I hope anyone who's seen the film or is about to see the film will uh, justify. There's barely a woman or man who can't talk in the most extraordinary eloquent terms, Jim included. And secondly, there was, one of the things I'm fascinated by as a documentary maker is the notion of truth. What is the truth? You know, who's telling it? Who's hiding it? What is it? And this, it seemed to me, was in that sense, the perfect film, certainly for somebody as curious and nosy as me, in that you start with one truth, i.e., X killed Y, and by the end, you've got, I hope, uh, a completely different truth. And it's been exposed, not because the people at the outset were bad or anything, but peculiarly because they sort of believed that that was what it was about. And then one particular character who Jim introduced me to is, who was a reporter, court reporter at the time, exemplifies that journey. She had, she starts in the court case absolutely believing that Carlos de Luna uh, is guilty. She ends taking his last call as he is executed, firmly convinced of the exact opposite. And she at no stage in that was, was looking to disprove the system. It was simply that as she went through this story, everything changed. And that, I have to say, that as a documentary maker is absolutely fascinating. It's the stuff of I don't know, it's the stuff of Agatha Christie, um, to use a terrible phrase, of detective stories, of everything, where you, you think one thing and then, oh, really? Gosh, is that what really happened? And in this film, uh, I hope the audience has taken on uh, an extraordinary journey where you can believe about three things before you end up at the conclusion. So Andrew, how, how do you think uh, working on this case as a law student uh, prepared you for your work now uh, representing people with claims of wrongful convictions? Yeah, well, it's a pretty direct line and, and one that, uh, and, 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 you know, looking back looks like a very direct line anyway. Um, you know, law school, you know, in law school, you spend so much time in the waters of theory and legal doctrine and, and less time on sort of the the factual development side of things and learning how to tell a story and, and present facts. And so this case was, this was really uh, an exceptional um, addition to my legal education to, to get this kind of training. And it's really basically the same kind of thing I do now for a living. I mean, now obviously we litigate on, on behalf of people and, and you know this case didn't involve that element, but the basic investigative techniques and tool sets is, is very similar to, to what we do in our practice uh, and was just extraordinary training. Can I was, interrupt you? But the other thing that I think drew, drew us all in, and I'm sure Jim is about to say this, is that this case could be really important in that it exposes the fundamental flaw of a central tenet of the US judicial system. I, you can't have a death penalty in a world where there is uncertainty because guess what? The, the death penalty rests on certainty. So I certainly, as a documentary maker, back to my truth point, if you're dealing with four different versions of truth, how can you be certain that you have executed the right person? Answer, you can't at any stage. And I'm, I bet that was the attraction for you as much as anything else that this, and I hope 
all our work together might prompt a change in attitude toward the death penalty ultimately. And I know that's been Jim's life work, so I will quit the field of conversation to leave him to comment on that. Well, that is that is so true, and and that's of course why this case has been so meaningful to me. And um, I will say that um, this was the first uh, um, experience I had writing with students, um, uh, writing the article and then the book that um, developed uh, from this. And since then, every single article that I have published, I've done with students um, as co-authors uh, and not simply as research assistants because of the value of that experience. But something Andrew said I think is really important. I've always thought as a lawyer, the practicing lawyer, when I did that and did these cases, that the statement of the facts was where you won or lost the case. And that is a narrative uh, endeavor. And you've got a huge record and you've got to draw from it into a very small piece of um, uh, somebody's time to actually introduce them to the case. And one of the things we struggled with the most, and then I watched, I know um, Patrick struggled with this too, because we talked about it, was how to put it together, just the, the basic order of the story. And I just, um, uh, since we're speaking here to lawyers, just want to um, you know, emphasize the importance of that kind of the work. It's great to get the law right and to come up with some fancy theory, but um, for me, it's the statement of facts and how you put it all together. And, and that's a really, really difficult task. And it's why we wanted this to be a documentary because we knew ultimately as much as we tried to do it in the book, we couldn't give it all of the power that it deserved and it needed another medium for that. Uh, and that's what I think Patrick has, has done here. Yeah. Well, I think, I think storytelling is, um, you know, pulling the facts together in a compelling way is, is certainly vital to any case because, you know, in a criminal case in particular where they're usually tried to a jury, I mean, those are human beings who are, are moved and compelled by stories. And um, they're called upon, of course, to apply the facts to the law in the case. But I think the story um, is, is what can often um, really bring it home for them and help them understand the case as a whole as non-lawyers. Um, and I think that's true of the audience for your film as well, Patrick. Um, you wanna make the story understandable and not hinge completely on legal technicalities or you probably lose your audience. Um, well, I hope I haven't lost the audience now by agreeing with you there. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> my, no, if it was entirely about legal technicalities, I think everybody would have stopped watching at minute two. <laughs> but but it, it is because it's a because legal technicalities involve human beings, and that I think was the other fascination of this case is that um, it was driven in part by the sheer propulsive force of the characters involved, the prosecuting attorney was a brilliant attorney. The defending attorneys, though decent people, well, in one case, particularly a decent man, was, were no match for him, even remotely. And so, as it were, the facts became irrelevant almost in this case, because they were swept aside by the power of oratory. And that, I think, it's one of those extraordinary twists that so mark this story and determine Carlos de Luna's ultimate fate. He had no means of conjuring up a defense attorney as powerful as the person who was prosecuting him. And it, all, it pretty much killed him. Um, so that's why I completely agree with you. The story is, the, is the, the motive force of both any decent argument and indeed this film, I hope. Is there any movement at this point to um, seek a posthumous uh, exoneration for Carlos de Luna? Well, there has been, I mean, Jim will know much better than I, there has been, and it's been tricky because uh, it's actually hinged on the person, on the chaplain who saw him die. And uh, he has, uh, is in the, last stage of his life and won't be fighting it. And so the family are slightly, have been talking to me about having another go at trying to get that. But I would be thrilled if, I mean, there are two things that we really, really want to come out of this film in this case, obviously is a change in uh, the law as regarding federal execution and 
particularly the suspension of it. And secondly, um, some degree of pardon for cars would be extraordinary. But anyway. Do each of you have any particular parting um, words of wisdom for us to take away and for our, for our audience to uh, ponder as we move forward in our efforts to improve the system of justice? Well, I guess I will say, since it is a particular audience that we know is um, focused on this, that um, uh, I live in the deepest admiration for the work that you do. I know the hard part is actually doing it and not writing about it and thinking about it and maybe even making films about it. Uh, and it's just the hard work that gets done uh, at every little minute of the kind of work that you all do that uh, makes the difference for your clients and, and for the system. So. Um, keep going and more power to you. Yeah, and it's only by doing the work that you do that something like this can never happen again, which is what we all devoutedly hope. I think that's my takeaway. Yeah, and I hope, you know, I hope people watch this film and, and you know, get some exposure to, you know, this particular story and the particular ways that the system broke down here. I mean, obviously the death penalty carries it just in its finality as an additional layer of gravity and moral weight to it. But these types of errors occur in the whole range of, of cases that we deal with in our world and, and the broader uh, issues of wrongful conviction. So I hope people gain uh, awareness of those issues and help, help join us in the, in the fight to improve our system going forward and reduce these errors in, in death penalty cases and otherwise. Well, thank you. Um, it's been an honor to talk with you and um, we'll, we will keep uh, fighting the fight and look forward to more successes and, and uh, on behalf of our clients and um, want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your thoughts with our audience. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>